Um, Ephesians chapter number one, we take the opportunity to welcome those who are joining us by way of the video broadcast. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. And we hope that you would follow uh, wherever you're watching, that you would follow with us here this morning as we get into God's Word and unpack some of these great truths that Paul has written in the book of Ephesians. As we are excited about it, we pray that you also would be excited as you listen, as you follow in your Bibles, as you take notes, as you uh, hear God's Word this morning. So here we are into our third week as we journey through the book of Ephesians. And uh, three weeks ago I introduced this teaching to you uh, and, and how the book was wonderfully written uh, by the Apostle Paul. And then I took you to the Ephesians blessing. Do you remember that? The Ephesians blessing in verse number 3. And then last week my message was on verse 3 to 6, which is the chosen in Christ. And today I will teach and preach on the subject, our redemption in Christ. And as we progress through this message, you will see why I believe, and I, you may disagree, and those of you watching by way of the video broadcast may disagree, but I pray by the end of this message, um, you will see my point, and you will see why I am about to say what I am about to say. As we progress through this message, you will see why I believe that the day Christ laid down His life was the greatest day in history. Redemption was the greatest event in history, and our Redeemer, the greatest person in history. And we wonderfully chose that song this morning to coincide with our message that the greatest day in history was the day that Jesus Christ laid down His life. The greatest event in history to us is redemption. And the greatest person in history to us is our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a possibility that this message, and I strongly believe there's a possibility that it's going to go into two parts. Uh, in order for me to complete my message in 45 minutes, it has to be five pages. This one's about 12 pages. So I don't expect to finish in 45 minutes. But I pray that you who follow this online would follow it in two parts and then make your decisions at the end of the second part or accumulate your prayer notes or your notes for meditation at the end of the second part rather than just listening to the first part. It will make more sense to you as you put both parts together. So you can follow that online in its entirety. So let's read Ephesians chapter number 1, verse 3 to verse 10. Now your brother in Christ has wonderfully read it to you, but I'm just going to go through it again one more time. Ephesians chapter number 1, verse 3 to verse 10. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. Verse 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in Him. We're going to stop right there, and we're going to focus on verse 7 to verse 10. Over the last three weeks, we went from verse 3 to verse 6. Now we're going to focus on verse 3 to verse 10. And I'm so glad in a way, and I was sharing this with uh, Dr. David Ball from the college, and I was saying if I had a chance to do the open learning section, the Bible study section on Ephesians, I would do it by itself rather than uh, together with the course that we're currently doing. And I'm so glad for this opportunity that you've taken a break for Bible study because it gives me a chance to stick with Ephesians 1 right now and not move on. Because I'm so excited as I read each word, as I get into each word and look at its meaning and what Paul is trying to say and with the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm just so excited. I can't seem to move away from Ephesians chapter number 1. So as I go line by line looking at these amazing truths, I'm excited and I hope that you would follow with us and also have that revelation in your heart concerning Jesus Christ and redemption in verse 7 to verse 10. And so verse 7 says, In Him, and I'm going to get you to underline this, In Him we have redemption. Underline that in your Bible, redemption. We have redemption through His blood. 
the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of His grace, which He made known to us, well, sorry, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. So we come across this word called redemption. Can somebody say redemption? Redemption. Redemption through His blood. So the title of our message this morning is Redemption in Christ. And let's take a deeper look at this word redemption and its associated word, Redeemer. You sang it during the offering time, My Redeemer Lives. The word redemption and its associated word, Redeemed. And the word redeemed... Is used widely, you've heard it in church many times, but the word redeemed is used widely in the economic sense, in the economic world, in economic terms, when we redeem one thing for another of equal value. Many of you gather Tesco vouchers or vouchers from other shops and so forth and so on and coupons. And for example, we collect those vouchers, we collect those coupons, we take it to the store and we redeem it for something of equal value. Are you with me right now? However, as you listen to my message this morning, as I teach and I preach to you today and next week, you're going to see that redemption in Scripture is far more than the simple idea of exchanging one thing for another of equal value. The word redemption comes from six legal terms, and I'm not going to bombard you with these terms because they are difficult to pronounce, difficult to spell, so I'm not going to bombard you with them, but I'm going to give you just the meanings of the first five, and we're going to focus on the sixth one this morning. The first one is a legal term for redemption, means this means being legally acquitted, number one. Number two, a legal repayment or cancellation of debt or a pardon. Number three, the legal process of adopting a child. Number four, to legally reconcile two disputing parties. And the fifth one is related to buying or purchasing. So you find that the word redeemed has all those different meanings. They are used in different economic senses and they are used in different legal ways. And the sixth one that I want to focus on this morning, which will come up on the screen, is the word lutru, L-U-T-R-O-O. Can you say that with me? Lutru. And along with its forms, its other words that, 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 that go along with it, it means to release from captivity. So we have the word redemption, lutru, uh, which means to release from captivity. And it's referred to paying a ransom in order to release a person from bondage, to release a person from the bondage of sin, especially that of slavery. So when we see that word lutru, it means to release from captivity. Redemption is lutru, which is a word used to refer to paying a ransom in order to release somebody from captivity. And especially in the Roman times, it has to, had to do with releasing somebody from slavery. Let me tell you a little story. True story. A missionary in West Africa was trying to convey the meaning of the word redeemed. Maybe you, can I just take a break from the story for a minute? Maybe you would try to explain to somebody what the word redeemed means. And here's a story of a missionary in West Africa was trying to convey the meaning of the word redeemed in the Bambara language. So he asked his African assistant to express it in his native tongue. We say, the assistant replied, that God took our heads out. How does that explain redemption? The missionary asked. The man told him that many years ago, some of his ancestors had been captured by slave traders, chained together and driven to the sea coast. Each of the prisoners had a heavy iron collar around his neck. And as the slaves passed through a village, a chief might notice a friend among the captives and offer to pay the slave traders in gold, ivory, silver or brass. The prisoner would be redeemed by the payment. His, his, his head then would be taken out of his iron collar. What an unusual and graphic illustration of the word redeemed. His head was taken out of the iron collar. So when the missionary asked his assistant to convey the word redeemed, the man said, it is our heads that are taken out. 
And this is exactly what Paul says in Ephesians chapter number 1, verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. What does it mean? Jesus died on the cross to purchase our freedom from the bondage of sin and death. I ask you right now, even at this moment, I make the call to you right now. I appeal to your hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I ask you at the outset of my message, have you put your trust in Jesus as your Redeemer? Let Him take your head out of the enslaving collar of sin and death and let Him set you free. Paul was drawing his use of the word redemption from the era that he lived in. I guess if I was teaching and preaching a topical sermon this morning, this is not a topical sermon, but an ex expository sermon. Topical sermons have to do, for example, in, in the current climate with the, with the Olympics, a topical sermon would be about the Olympics, how to run the race, how to achieve the gold, how to, how to go past the finish line. And Paul talks about that. He talks about running the race and getting the goal and getting the prize. So when Paul speaks and brings a message across, he talks about what was happening around him during that time. And so he draws his word from the word, sorry, he draws the word uh, redemption from the time, the era that he lived in. During Paul's time, the New Testament time, the Roman Empire had six million slaves and slave trading, buying and selling slaves was a big business. If a person wanted to be free, or sorry, if a person wanted to free a loved one or a friend who was a slave, he had to buy that slave for himself and then grant him his freedom. There would be a certificate in place to testify that the slave had been delivered from bondage. And that's where we get the lutru from. And that lutru is today what we've come to know as redemption. It was used to designate the freeing of a slave. Now that we understand the root of the word redemption and its meaning, what does it mean to us today? Why are we hearing it today? What does it mean to us? The New Testament speaks of this lutro, this redemption. And it takes us to the cross of Calvary where Jesus Christ and the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ set us free from the curse of sin and death. And I believe that was the greatest day in history. He paid the redemption price to buy for himself fallen mankind and to set fallen mankind free from their sin. From the time, the tragic, from the time of the tragic disobedience of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, which we refer to as the fall of man, Every human being, now listen to me clearly, every human being born into this world is enslaved into sin. We come under the bondage of this corrupt world, this evil world, and we're separated from God. Paul says this in Romans 8, 21, that the whole of creation is enslaved to the corruption of sin. Now that is difficult to accept. It's difficult to accept that we are born into this sinful world and we adopt the nature of this sinful world. We become corrupted from our childhood days. We become corrupted and ensnared and entangled and trapped in the sin and the corruptness and the evil of this world. It's a, it's a difficult thing to accept, but it's the truth. Sin is fallen, fallen man's captor and slave owner. And sin demands a price for his release, and that price is death. Sin holds us captive. Sin is our slave master. Sin is our captor. And if we're going to be released, we have to pay the price with death. Death is a price that had to be paid for man's redemption from sin. Galatians 1.3 says this. It speaks of our of our Jesus who gave himself for our sins, meaning that he gave up his life for our sins, that we might be delivered from this present evil age. Galatians 1.3 says that about Jesus. 
Colossians 1 verse 13 to 14, this phenomenal scripture that I love, this is what he says, He has delivered us from the powers of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the sons of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. What does it mean? Jesus conveyed us from darkness into light. He bought us out of darkness and placed us in light. So now we have a basic understanding of redemption. Let's go a little further and maybe a little deeper in these next few moments uh, and look at five elements of redemption. Five elements of redemption. And the reason we're doing this, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the reason why we're pursuing this writing down of the notes and listening and watching and paying attention and not getting up here and getting you to jump and dance and shout all over the place. Whoo, Jesus is alive. Whoo, He redeemed me. Let's, let me tell you, out of all my years of being a pastor, very few people remember what Jesus actually did for them. They don't actually understand what Jesus did for them. There's a whole lot of jumping and shouting, but not really an understanding. I've come to understand that in the church, many people know scripture, but very few people understand scripture. One of the reasons why there's confusion is because we know Scripture, but we don't understand Scripture. So we know about tongues, and we know about praise, and we know about worship, but we don't understand what it means. So I've realized that in the church past, in our previous church, we knew a lot of Scripture, but we didn't understand Scripture. And in order for us to understand Scripture, we have to pause. We have to approach each word. We've got to look at what it means. And so we find that Jesus is our Redeemer. He's established our redemption. We've made it known today that it was the greatest day in history, that Jesus Christ is the greatest person in history. And we're going to figure out this morning, between verse 7 and verse 10, five elements of redemption. And the first one, number one, is in verse 7, the first part of verse 7. In Him we have redemption. Underline the, underline the word Him. In Him we have redemption. That means Jesus is our Redeemer. In order for there to be redemption, there has to be a Redeemer. There had to be a Redeemer. One who was willing to pay the price. And Jesus Christ is our Redeemer from sin. It is Jesus Christ Himself who paid the price for our release from the curse of sin and death. Isn't that wonderful? It is Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, that stepped down from eternity into time. You'll remember when I preached that message, how He took that downward steps. He came down those steps. He left His throne in glory. He descended to earth, came in the form of man, in the image of man, in the likeness of man, to lay down His life for you and I, that we may be delivered from the curse of sin and death. That we may be redeemed. Jesus Christ is our Redeemer. And our redemption is in Him. You need to understand that you, we, your, your breakthrough is not linked to your pastor. Your breakthrough is not linked to your church. Your breakthrough is not linked to your, your, your denomination. But everything about your life is linked to Him. Jesus Christ is the one who redeemed you. Paid the price that you may be delivered from the curse of sin and death. I asked the question, was Jesus qualified to be a redeemer? And your answer will be, surely yes, He was qualified to be a redeemer. And you may have many reasons as to why He qualifies to be our redeemer. Love may be one reason. Mercy may be another reason. But I want to take you to the Old Testament. And you don't have to turn there right now, but write this down. Leviticus chapter 25 verse 47 to 49 speaks of this word, kinsman. Redeemer. Have you heard that before? Kinsman Redeemer. The Lord brings His children out of the land of bondage and He brings them into this place where He has this massive church service for millions of people and He brings His instruction to them and He speaks in Leviticus about a kinsman Redeemer. And a kinsman Redeemer had to have three qualifications. Number one, He had to be related to the one needing redemption. You can go back online and look at this. Number one, he needed, he had to be related to the one needing a redemption. Number two, he must be able to pay the price. And number three, he must be willing to do so. 
And as you go back online and you look at this and you hear my message again, go back to Leviticus and look at these three points and see if you could find them. Number one, he had to be related to the one needing redemption. Number two, he must be able to pay the price. And number three, he had to be willing to do so. The Lord Jesus perfectly met all these requirements. If you want to know more about this, like I said, go back and look at it in Leviticus. Number two, the second element is the redeemed. Number one, we said who the, Jesus Christ is our redeemer. Number two, the second element of redemption is the redeemed. In him, we, underline the word we, we, verse seven, the first word was him, him was the redeemer. Number, the second word is we, we are the redeemed. In him, we have redemption through his blood. Do have some we in the house today? <laughs> we have been redeemed. We are the redeemed, the ones who have been set free by his blood. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. To fully understand who we are and what we've been set free from, we must look a little further at Scripture. Look at Ephesians chapter number 2 with me very quickly. Ephesians chapter number 2. And I want to read to you a little chunk of Scripture this morning. You can follow in your Bibles. We've been redeemed. What have we been redeemed from? When you say amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me, you understand that your life was a wretched life. You understand the past and you understand where you are now, how God has wonderfully delivered you. And so you can appreciate where you were and where you are now. So to understand and appreciate the Redeemer and the redeemed and redemption, you got to look at Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 1, which says, And you He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. In other words, you were dead, you were in sin, we were in sin, we were dead, and we were walking according to the power of the prince of the air. In other words, his name is Satan. We were walking according to the power of the devil. Verse 3, who now works, sorry, um, yeah, who... Verse 2, who now works in the sons of disobedience. Verse 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as others. Look at our life before Christ. This is who we were before Christ. We were fulfilling the lusts of the flesh, not only the lusts of the flesh, but that of the mind. And we were by nature, why? Because we were born into this sinful world. We adopted the nature of the sinful world. So by nature, we became children of wrath. Like everybody else. Verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And what did He do? He raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Mm -hmm. Can you see that right now? Look at verse 11. Therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are, who are called uns, the, uns, the uncircumcision by what is called circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that, that at the time you were without Christ, we were what? Without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers of the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Think about that for a moment. This was, this was your life before Christ. 
Gentiles in the flesh. We were called the uncircumcision. We were without Christ. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Strangers of the covenants of promise. In other words, God's promises were there and we were so far away from it. We could not recognize it, believe it, understand it. We were strangers to it. This is having no hope without God in the world. And verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We were far away, having no hope, having no promise, having no passport to Israel, having no blessings. We were away from God. We were in this terrible state. We were wandering. We were strangers to the promise, walking in the futility of our minds. Fulfilling the lusts of the flesh, wandering in darkness without hope. We were a people that needed deliverance. We needed redemption. And what did, what did Christ do? Christ came for us to deliver us from our terrible state. To pay the price with His own blood and reconcile us to God. And what does God now call us? Does He call us? Does He call us corrupt? Does He call us corrupt by nature? Does He call us a people with no hope? Does He call us a people who are strangers? No, He calls us holy. He calls us blameless. He calls us His sons. Sons of God. For the glory of His name. What an awesome thing this is. Even today when I read my Bible, I see my sinful, terrible life before Christ. Before I accepted Jesus. Even to this very moment as I come down to prepare to preach to you. I'm in my office meditating on what I'm saying. I often drop to my knees just in, there's no worship song. Nobody's singing anything. I can't hear any music. But I just read the Bible and I see my life. How it was before Christ. The terrible person that I was. And how I struggled with the things of the flesh and my mind. Walking in the futility of my mind. Having no purpose. Having no destiny. Being called various names of the world. But then understanding how Jesus Christ came to redeem me. And let me be honest with you right now. The day I gave my life to Christ. I did not understand what happened. I knew something happened. But I couldn't understand it. I didn't know what a redeemer was. I didn't know what redemption was. But today. Oh how I know my redeemer. Hallelujah. I know that Jesus Christ has set me free. And I understand now how it has all taken place. I understand that I needed a redeemer. And Jesus Christ came to be my redeemer. And he gave me his redemption. Until a person realizes, until you realize your need for redemption. A person sees no need for redemption. A phrase that we've been coining in our church for these last few weeks as we've been fixing doctrines in our worship team and fixing doctrines in our teaching and singing the right songs and not glorifying man but glorifying God. As we've been singing those things and putting those things right, we've coined this phrase, unless you realize something is broken, you will never fix it. And unless you realize you are broken, you will never need someone to fix you. We realize that we are broken and we needed God to fix us. Jesus Christ came to fix us. We realize that we were in a prison and Jesus Christ came to set us free. Unless you realize that you are in a prison of sin and death, you will never need someone to free you. Jesus Christ came and delivered us and freed us from our prison and he places us in himself and in that place in verse 3 Ephesians 1 verse 3 he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus amen so we spoke of the Redeemer we spoke of the redeemed let us today at this moment right now Number three, talk a little bit about the redemptive price. The Redeemer is Jesus Christ. The redeemed are you and I. What about the price? The redemptive price in verse 7. Let's go back to verse 7. Look at the end of it. It says, in Him we, the redeemed, have redemption. In other words, bought and paid for, literal, been set free from captivity. Through what? His blood. The redemptive price was His blood.
we who sing of our freedom in Christ. And we celebrate the grace of God. We who sing and we celebrate and we celebrate the grace of God, we know that our freedom came at a cost, came at a price. Jesus Christ paid for our freedom with His own blood. The penalty for sin was death. Jesus Christ did not deserve death, but came and laid down His life. A sinless man laid down His life Paid the price with a special currency. I put that in purposely. Sounds a bit simple, but a special currency. He paid the price with a special currency, not with the currency of gold or silver, not with the currency of metals and jewels, not with the currency of, of fine linen and things made with the hands of man, but with the currency of His precious blood. When we look back at the Old Testament, when we look back at the Old Testament, we see this blood sacrifice. The sacrificial animals that was continually offered on the altars at the tabernacle and then later at the temple. When you read your Old Testament, you find that the blood was never able. You need to understand this. That blood that was offered at the tabernacle, that blood that was sacrificially offered at the, at, uh, the temple, was never able to cleanse us of our sin. Nor was it able... Oh, sorry, nor was it intended to cleanse us of our sin. It was never able nor intended to cleanse us of our sins. Those animals were symbolic. That sacrifice was symbolic. The real thing, somebody shout the real thing. The real thing was to arrive later on and it did. Hallelujah. History records, not just your Bible, but history records. It is recorded in the, in the Roman writings. Go and look in the museums and look at the pages of history. History records that somebody arrived on the scene to pay the price. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Was, was John the Baptist blind? Could he not recognize a man and a lamb? No, John was saying, In the past you sacrificed animals, but here is the one who's arrived, who is the Lamb that's going to take away the sins of the world. And this is the only sacrifice that you need and the only currency that has to be paid for the sins of the world to be forgiven. That every person who believes in Christ will be set free from the curse of sin and death. And here is the special currency. If you're in Nigeria, the currency applies. If you're in the UK, the currency applies. If you're in Gambia, the currency applies. If you're in Mars, the currency applies. It is a special currency. The stock market doesn't control it. Prime ministers don't control it. Kings don't control it. It is the one currency that separates man from sin. And it is the blood of Jesus. Christ. Hebrews 9 12 wonderfully tells us that our deliverance and reconciliation to God did not come with the blood of bulls and goats, but with the calves or cows, but with the blood of Jesus Christ. Though men of this world, from Mahatma Gandhi to Martin Luther King to various people in history, have shed their blood for various reasons, none of them have shed their blood for the remissions of sin. For though Martin Luther King died, and we remember his speech, I was still in, the, in sin. I was still in the prison of sin and death, under the curse of death. Though Mahatma Gandhi was a great man who ministered to people and brought people together, yet his blood or his life could not set me free from the curse of sin and death. But oh, Jesus Christ, the greatest person in history, came down from heaven and shed his blood that I can be delivered from the curse of sin and death. That's why I believe he is the greatest person in history. We have been redeemed not by perishable things like gold and silver. Not with a currency that fluctuates in the stock market. Nor loses its value with time. My God saw through all of that. John the Revelator. In the book of Revelation chapter number 5 verse 8 to verse 10 says this. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp. Golden bowls of incense, golden bowls full of incense, 
which are the prayers of the saints in verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and every tongue and every nation. And you've made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth out of every tribe and every tongue and every nation. Here's a currency that no matter where you come from or where you grow up or how you look, that currency will buy you and set you free from the curse of sin and death. Oh, praise the Lord. Number four. I don't know, maybe we can complete that. I'm not sure. Let's see, number four. So what do we speak about so far? The Redeemer, the Redeemed, the Redemptive Price. Number four, what was the redemptive result? What was the result of all this? The redemptive result is in verse 7 to verse 9. Let's look at the second part of verse 7 and the first part of verse 9. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. What was the redemptive result? Number one, the forgiveness of sins. In Him, the Redeemer, we, the redeemed, through His blood, the redemptive price. What did we get? Number one, forgiveness. Number two, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Number two, wisdom and prudence or wisdom and insight. And we're going to get to that in the next few moments. Let's stick with forgiveness and maybe we'll stop with this today. What was the result? We were forgiven. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the primary result of redemption for every believer today is the forgiveness of sin. The forgiveness of sin. If you forget everything else I say today, know today that Jesus Christ came to forgive you of your sins. If you can't catch up with the notes, if you're unable to follow online, if you're unable to read your Bible, but you can hear somebody speak to you today, hear these words, Jesus came to forgive you of your sin. It is one of the dearest blessings to those who experience His power. For those of you who know the power of forgiveness, you don't want to let it go. It's the dearest blessing to you. Though God has blessed us with many things, our dearest blessing is the forgiveness of sin. Jesus says this in Matthew 26, 28 at the Last Supper, in the closeness of His, in the intimacy with His disciples, He says this, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the remissions of sin. The word remission here is the forgiveness of sins. This blood, this cup, is a new covenant in my blood which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. What a wonderful truth that is. What a wonderful reality that is. God's forgiveness breaks the grip of guilt. For many of us, sin grips, and I, as I put this example together, you would identify with it. Sin grips its icy hands around our hearts and does not want to let go. Many of you struggle with this. Every day we, we find ourselves doing things that we don't want to do and because sin grips our hearts with its, with its icy hands and does not want to let go. And as it grips and as it strengthens its grip around us, it causes the joy to leave our lives. And very soon we forget that God is able to forgive us. Not based on what we have done, but based on what God has done. In verse 7 to verse 10, we find that that grip of sin, that icy grip of sin around our hearts that's been smothering us and choking us has been broken by Jesus Christ. He has released us from the curse of sin and death. And then suddenly, we can breathe again. And now that we breathe again, we don't breathe the things of this world, but we breathe the things of the newness of life, the new creation in Christ Jesus. We're a new person. One of my heroes in the faith, Charles Spurgeon, says this, and I thought I could write it down on a piece of paper to bring it to you, but maybe if I read it really slowly, you could follow with me. Charles Spurgeon says this about forgiveness. He writes in one of his journals, Could there be a sweeter word in any language than that word, forgiveness? 
Could there be a sweeter word in any language than that word forgiveness? And you know how precious that word is in our relationships with people. That word forgiveness. Though we can speak many highfalutin, intelligent words, that simple word forgiveness means so much. And Charles Spurgeon writes, could there be any sweeter word in any language than that word forgiveness? And especially when it sounds in a guilty sinner's ears. It is like the silver notes of the Jubilee to the captive Israel. When Israel had to be set free, the year of Jubilee, the sound of the trumpets, the sound of the music would go out and they would say, hey, it's our year of deliverance, we're free. And that word forgiveness from Christ to the sinner's ears is a sound of Jubilee. You have been set free. Blessed, blessed forever. <laughs> that, that the dear star of pardon of pardon, which is Jesus Christ, which shines into the condemned cell and gives the perishing a gleam of hope amid the midnight of despair. And he goes on to write, Can it be possible that sin, such sin as mine, can be forgiven, forgiven altogether and forgiven forever? Charles Spurgeon writes, and you and I would agree, well, I'm not talking about you, I will agree, hell is my portion as a sinner. Hell was my portion as a sinner. There's no possibility of escape from it while, still rem while sin remains upon me. Can the load of guilt be uplifted? Can the crimson stain be removed? Can the hard, unyielding stones of my prison house ever be loosed from their walls or the doors be lifted off their hinges? Jesus tells me that I may yet be clear. I may yet be be free forever blessed be the revelation of atoning love which not only tells me that pardon is possible but that it is secured to all who rest in Christ Jesus hmm. I have believed he said in the appointed propitiation, even Jesus Christ crucified, and therefore my sins are at this moment and forever forgiven by virtue of his pain, of his death. What a joy this is, he writes. What a bliss to be perfectly, to be a perfectly pardoned soul. My soul dictates all her powers to him who is unput. Let me just repeat that. My soul dictates all her powers to him who, of his own unpurchased love, became our surety and bought me from the prison of sin and death. I bow before the throne which absolves me. I clasp the cross which delivers me. I serve him henceforth all the days of my life. The one who redeemed. Hallelujah. These are the words of Charles Spurgeon. What wonderful words they are to, to hear. The word forgiveness finds its root. When we look at the word forgiveness, let me close with forgiveness and we'll come back next week and do um, wisdom and insight. The word forgiveness finds its root in the word afiemi. It's on, it's on the screen right now. Afiyimi, this is the word. It finds its root in this word, which basically means to send away. Somebody say send away. Amen. To send away. And we find this reference in the Old Testament on the Day of Atonement. On that day, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest selected two, two unblemished sacrificial goats. Somebody shout two. Two unblemished sacrificial goats. One goat was killed and its blood was sprinkled on the altar. As a sacrifice. The high priest then placed his hands on the second goat. Symbolically laying the sins of the people on the animal. And then the animal would be taken the furthest away from the people. And released. Believing that the animal will never come back. So the first animal was sacrificed and its blood put upon the altar. The second animal, the priest would take the people's sin and put it upon the animal. And then the people would take the animal, the priest would take the animal far away from the people and release the animal so that 
it will never find its way back. It is from that that we get the word scapegoat. Why? Because all of the sins were put on this scapegoat, on this goat that went away or was taken away and symbolically all the sins were taken away. Now we know as we read the Old Testament that though they laid hands on that goat and no matter how far that goat went, Israel still remained in sin. We still remained in sin. That enactment, as beautiful, as meaningful as it was, did not actually remove the sins of the people. And we know that very well today. What, they're doing, what, what they were doing was a picture, was a typology of what God the Father would do through His Son, Jesus Christ. So it is from that sending away, from that affiemi, from that sending away, that we get the word forgiveness. Through the shedding of his own blood, Jesus took the sins of the world upon himself. Hallelujah. He was the animal that took the sins of the world. Here's Jesus Christ on the cross and he carries the weight of the world upon him. All the sins of the world he takes upon himself. And he carried it to an infinite distance away where it could never return to us. Oh, praise God. He carried it away so that it could never, ever return to us. That is the extent of God's forgiveness for our sins. It is sad today, as I close, it is sad today to see that many Christians fail to see the extent of God's forgiveness. It is tragic that many in our church and in the church worldwide are depressed about their life thinking that God does not forgive them and, and thinking and acting as if God still holds some grudge or judgment or anger against them for their sins. Even in church, many Christians will not partake in Holy Communion for months because of something that has happened. They fell into sin. They went backwards a little bit, did something that they should not be doing and find that they will not take Holy Communion now because they feel, I'm a sinner. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says that if we ask for forgiveness, He is faithful and just to forgive us. And when we know that God has forgiven us, and when we understand the extent of His forgiveness, we get up and we get going. Psalm 103 verse 12 says this, As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Can you, can you hold the east and the west? Can you, you can't as far as the east is from the west. God has removed our transgressions from us. Hundreds of years before Calvary, hundreds of years before Jesus laid down his life, Micah said this, Micah said this, listen in Micah chapter 7 verse 18 to 19, this is what he said, Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgressions of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will have compassion on us and subdue our iniquities. And you will remember this if you read your Bible. You will cast our sins into the depth of the sea. We do not understand forgiveness. When we do not understand forgiveness, we do not understand what has been so wonderfully gifted to us. This is a gift of God. Forgiveness is a gift of God that you need to be thankful for. As you're thankful for people who give you gifts in your worship, in your prayer, don't forget to thank God for this amazing gift of forgiveness. We often find ourselves in a place of great condemnation when sin grips us. Condemnation is always the next part of the process. When there is sin, when there is unforgiveness, when we feel there is no forgiveness, the next thing that comes is condemnation. First there is the guilt and then condemnation like a heavy rock that's laden upon our chest and we're unable to breathe or move. But listen to what Romans 8.1 says and you know the scripture. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Hallelujah. If you're in Christ Jesus, you are redeemed from your prison cell. The grip of sin has been loosed from your heart. You've been set free by the currency that is special and not of this world, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 
And the result is you have been forgiven of your sin. So there's no reason to be condemned anymore. Because you are in Christ Jesus. Friends, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, forgiveness in Jesus Christ is undeserved. We don't deserve it. But God came in His wonderful love and gave it to us. It came at a cost to Him. But it is free to us. And it is complete. Can you shout Amen? Those who have Christ have the freedom from sin, freedom of the sin of the past, and freedom of the sin of the present, and freedom of the sin of the future. Let me conclude this point. Look again at verse number 10. Oh, sorry, verse 9. Well, let's, let's read the whole thing again from verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. According to the riches of His grace. Underline that in your Bible. According, according to the riches of His grace. That word according to the riches of His grace is important. Why? Our forgiveness is according. Somebody shout according. You may think that's just a word, Pastor. There's a, there's a, what's, what's the point? Here's the point. The word is important. It is according to the riches of His grace. Our forgiveness is according to the riches of His grace. Let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about before we close in the next few minutes. I want to convey this point across as we close and you can go home and meditate on this. If you were to go to a multi-millionaire today in our nation or our city and say to him that we're trying to raise money to build or buy a church building, would you contribute some money towards our building fund? And this multi-millionaire or billionaire gave you a check for 20 pounds. He would be giving out of his riches. Write that word down, out. He would be giving out of his riches. Why do I say he's giving out of his riches? Because even the poor person can give 20 pounds. But if he were to write you a check for 50,000, a hundred thousand. If he were to write you a check for the whole amount, he would, be not, he would not be giving out of his riches. He would be giving according to his riches. Have I lost you there? Christ, God the Father, did not give out of his riches, but he gave according to his riches. Hallelujah. According to his riches, that's what the Bible says. And God did not only give out of his riches, but according to his riches. Not only did he forgive us according to his riches, but the Bible says he lavished it upon us. Imagine a millionaire say, I lavish this upon you. I give it to you in abundance because I'm not giving out of something. I'm giving according to something. God can give according to because that's what he is. He is full of that. He is full of forgiveness, so He can forgive. God does not say, I'm going I'm to give you a little bit of forgiveness because I myself am struggling. I don't have enough forgiveness for the whole world. No, He forgives because He is full of forgiveness. Oh, hallelujah. So He doesn't give out of, but He gives according. And that is why I'll throw this in. When you finance something in church, you don't give out of, but you give according. And we'll stop right there. When on the first day of the week, when you bring your, 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 your finances as part of your worship, you don't give out of, but you give according. Praise the Lord. Next week we will do the next part of redemptive result and we'll conclude our fifth element of redemption.